Off to a slow start. I can hear somebody online. Um, I'm going to need to mute. Let's see who's. Uh, oh, anyhow, just. All right, all right, cool. I always need five more minutes than I have. Wonderful. So um, this is session seven in the sh series called Shift, which is called Pricing Strategies, Seller Pricing Strategies. Um, it's interesting that the people that I'm coaching that have listings that need seller pricing strategies aren't here. So just, just, I just noticed that. So what we're going to do today, there's a perspective on pricing strategies, studying the market, approaching, getting the right price, and managing listings. So we're going to start with the perspective on pricing strategies. Um, when the market shifts towards a buyer's market, the listings sit. So have we, those of you that were here yesterday, I went through some of the statistics just for fun, right? And what's happening is days on market is getting longer, right? Um, days to sell is taking longer. Um, there are more expired listings now than there have been in the last four years. Um, so in a buyer's market, real estate becomes a commodity. What does that mean? Don't everybody blurt it out at once. So in a seller's market, those of you that have represented buyers in a seller's market, it's basically people climbing over each other to try and get something, right? Do you understand that they would physically hurt the other people, trip them on the way if that's what they thought would work? And so do they care? I've helped people write offers on overpriced, beaten up uh, houses um, for $100,000 over the list price. Do you understand? Buyers were not making informed, intelligent, comparative decisions. There's one home for sale in this price range, 20 people make an offer on it. When there are 20 homes for sale in the price range, and you're adding number 21 to the market, you're in a different world, right? You understand your house, I used to, this is the line I used to use with sellers. I said, although I said, this is what I would say. I'd say, all right, I know, you know, houses are like old shoes. They're comfortable, right? They, they fit good. You're happy. But if you were going to sell them, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, really, uh, how much could you get, right? People aren't going to pay a lot for used shoes, for old shoes. So your house, when it comes on the market, to mix my metaphors, is like a box of cereal on the shelf at the Safeway, right? You're just another box of, do people buy cereal because of the box? Do you think people have ever bought a book because of the cover? You, you haven't sold books, right? Do people buy books because of the cover? They buy cereal because of the box, right? They do, right? And so th is it possible that the cereal you're buying is not the best cereal, but there's actually better cereal, but you never buy it, right? Because it's down at the bottom and you have to bend to get it, right? So we buy cereal because of its placement, and because of the packaging, because of the box, right? And the placement of the box. Do you understand this is what your house is going to be? Your house is going to be another box on the shelf, right? And so, it, and people will judge your house by the way it looks from the outside. And they're going to be, do you look at prices? I actually go through this without buying cereal with people. Do you look at the prices of the cereal? Right? Do you sometimes buy other cereal because the price is a little bit lower than, you know, right? So they're doing the same thing with your house. Your house has now become a commodity. There's more of them on the market. Um, we have to stand out. Only properties in good conditions and price right will sell in a buyer's market. Only properties in good conditions and priced right will sell in a buyer's market. Only 
those properties are going to sell, right? In the past market, you could take a beat up, run down rat trap and put it on the market and get a million dollars if it's in the right zip code, right? That's not going to happen when there's a bunch of homes on the market. Uh, a price can correct bad condition, but condition can't correct bad price. Do you understand what that's saying? If I, I've sold, I sold a house in downtown San Jose. I was a listing agent. I'm talking to the owner about the buyer, and at one point the owner says to me, wait a second, they're not going to live there, are they? This is the owner of the house that I just sold to the buyer. He was expecting to tear it down, right? I mean, why would anybody, it had $30,000 worth of Section 1 termite work. Why would anybody want that house? Well, we priced it right, and it sold. Right, do you, you understand? But if the can we with a price can correct a bad condition, but condition can't correct a bad price, right? So if we had fixed that place up as best as possible, that doesn't mean we're going to get any price we want, right? Do you understand? Price becomes more of the determiner in a slower market than condition, right? You can uh, correcting price represents eighty percent of your marketing efforts. Correct pricing represents 80% of your marketing efforts. Hmm. If I'm a geographic, what, what is this saying to me if I'm marketing to a geographic area? Give me a for instance as to what marketing effort would involve that concept. Knowing everything that's going on in the market, having a neighborhood update, right? The graphs and charts, are you communicating what the days on market are, how many expired listings there were, is the inventory up or down, are you having those conversations with people in your target marketing area? Are you educating them on what's happening in the real estate market? 80% of selling a house, I actually would say it's higher, but is pricing. Actually, probably closer to 100%, right? Pricing. Right? At the right price, anything will sell. Right? At the wrong price, nothing will. Um, when houses sold in a matter of days, agents were undervalued. There were a lot more. What was that company? Hope You Sell? Hope, Hope You Sell, was that their name? No, Help, Your, Help Yourself. Isn't that their name? Anyhow, um, I do that on purpose so people can't say their name correctly. But... Um, but yet when the market, when everybody was, when homes were selling in the first weekend for $100,000 over the list price, can you understand why sellers were thinking, well, I don't need a really good real estate agent. All I need is somebody that's breathing that can put a sign in front of the property and then we wait, right? I, I, you know, I might as well pay the least amount possible for a breathing real estate agent, right? And so those things happen for sale by owners and discount listing offices rise in the seller's market and fall in the buyer's market. When homes are sitting around, the sellers now are serious about what are you going to do to sell my home. Um, and uh, custom needs, they need to know your pricing strategies, your market knowledge, buyers, fiduciary commitment. Talk about that later. Knowledge of financing options. Does I ever mention that? Financing? You weren't here yesterday, but I mentioned it yesterday. So um, I, when I talk about what kinds of things you could have as bait that would make people want to meet with you, one of them is knowing financing options. Now, that might involve knowing a lender that could help you, but you ought to have a rudimentary understanding of, of financing options. Negotiation skills. Real estate agents sometimes ask me what they want to take another class. They want, they want to do something. If you wanted to take other instruction that could increase your income and wealth, take it on negotiations, right? If you're going to take an extra class, take a class on negotiation, right? It's um, so it, yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. I was at a seminar once, a guy named Brian Tracy, who's famous for this, teaching negotiating classes, was he did the first class in the morning. And the second class was a guy that was selling stuff, right? At the end of his class, he had books and stuff to sell. So he's smiling and he's standing in his booth and people are coming up to him and saying, so 395, is that the best you can do? 
I'm sure you don't want to carry all that stuff back with you. Should I come back? You know, and, and, he said, and then the next one, he says, what's going on? He said, there's like a line of people because we'd all been to a negotiation class, right? And we're, oh, here's a chance, you know. And, and, and then he found out that Brian Tracy was in the room before him. And he was like, oh, I get it, you know. They're negotiating me, right? Would you be more effective, not only as a real estate agent, but perhaps as a member of society, if you were more successful at negotiating resolutions with people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the opportunities for agents and for sellers? Shift happens. Maximize your effectiveness as a consultant. Have we been talking about studying the market? Have I done a class where I haven't talked about studying the market that you can remember? I can't. I would be. Uh, I wouldn't have done it if I had known. So study the market. Pre-qualify your sellers. What would be? What would that mean? What would be a pre-qualification question we would ask a seller? This is the audience participation part. Don't blurt out the answers. Raise your. <laughs> so somebody calls me up and they say, "I want to sell my home." Uh, I'd like you to come over. Let me just make sure I haven't missed something important. Uh, yes, okay. So they say, I want to sell my home. <laughs> I want you to come over and tell me how much my home is worth. I would say, great, that's fantastic. First question, um, why are you thinking of selling your home at this time? Why are you thinking of selling your home at this time? We're looking to move to Arizona. Cool. Well, actually, it's really hot. <laughs> yes, I've said that to people. Um, I know, but, but anyhow, it, 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 I, I take medication, but it just this is the best I get. So I say, um, yeah, it's um, yeah, that's great. Why Arizona? I hear it's warm in Arizona. Why why Arizona? And then they say, well, because uh, my um, daughter lives there. Oh, really? Wonderful, right? So you want to live, you know same area where your daughter lives. Why now? What's prompting you now? Oh, we're having our first grandchild. Now, does everybody understand where we've moved from, right? I want to know what my house is worth because I'm thinking about moving to we want to be with our daughter when our grandchild is born, right? Now, is that a stronger motivation than simply wanting to go where it's warm, right? That's a stronger motivation. And so what we, when is the child due? When would you like to be there, right? Do you, do you understand? And if somebody has a deadline, are they more motivated, right? What, so if they're, do you understand if they bought another house? <laughs> That's why they're motivated. They have a job transfer. They're motivated. Um, so pre um, so uh, why are you thinking of this time? Uh, describe your house to me. Do you know how much you currently have outstanding on the loan? Are you looking to net a certain amount when you sell your home? Are you looking to net a certain amount when you sell your home? I have these written out, by the way, these questions. Are you looking to net a certain amount when you're selling your home? They say yes. If um, they tell me how much they want to net and they tell me how much they owe, can I guess what they think their house is worth? Right? Would this be a useful thing in negotiation to know what they think their house is worth before I talk to them about this? Um, get the right price. Study the market. Be the local market economist. That's a new idea. Is it? No, I think I say that every time too. Be more knowledgeable than the headline. Research the local conditions and trends that will affect them. Preview more properties to get a better understanding of what's on the market. What happens when the market shifts is that real estate agents with more market knowledge do more business. And the one thing you could do to improve your abilities as a real estate agent is to go look at homes for sale. Because when you're looking at a sell, you, some of you have heard me say that the real problem with marketing and pricing is not the ones that have sold, it's the ones that haven't. So if I have a listing, the question, this is what I would say to a seller. I would say, well, when you bought this house, I assume you looked at others. I mean, this isn't the only house you looked at, was it? No. You looked at a bunch of them. More than 10, maybe? 
But at the end, you narrowed it down to a few, right? This one or that one or that one. Isn't that right? That's what everybody's doing. All those buyers out there circling the market are doing the same thing you were doing. They're going to narrow their search down to two or three homes. And the question is, first, is your home going to be one of them? And second, how are you going to compare at the, with the competition? Does everybody understand this? One of the lines that I would use is I would say there are two kinds of homes on the market. There are homes that get sold, and there are homes that get other people's homes sold. Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the home that sells, or do you want to be the home that causes other homes to sell? Do you want to have the home that people buy or the home that people point at, other agents point at, and say, look how great of a deal this one is compared to that? Do you want to be the compared to that one? You don't want to, right? Do you understand? So what are those two? What do those two homes look like? And how do you look compared to them? Maybe we ought to go look at them, right? Do you understand this presupposes that you know what the other two homes look like? Uh, right, and I would take clients to go look at them. Let's go shopping for a house. And when you show them homes that are much nicer than theirs for $100,000 less in a better neighborhood, I've still had people say, I like mine better. But they oftentimes would say, maybe we could lower the price. Um, preview, so I would assume if you were going to share your calendar with me, that I would see blocked out certain days, certain times for previewing property, right? I'm sure I'd see that, right? Right? <laughs> you, you, you didn't look very convincing. You didn't look convincing at all when you did that. She gave me one of the least convincing yeses. Um, going on the board tour is a good thing because it's an easy way to meet other agents and learn something and see some homes. It's not as good as you purposefully proactively previewing property. You will not become an expert on Santa Clara County. It's too big. You're not, not going to be an expert on San Jose. It's too big. You'll have difficulty with the Blossom Valley. It's the biggest. It's big in terms of the number of houses there, right? But could you become an expert in an area, right? Why don't we start there? If you're going to be an expert in an area, should you preview all the homes for sale in that area? Are they on the tour? No, not always. Not all at once, not in that area. So what happens in the tour, you see one over here for $2 million, and you see one over here for 700,000, you see one over here, it's a condo, and then you see another one over here, right? You understand you never end up learning a lot about a particular market, but you previewed home. So I believe you ought to go to the board tour. I went to the Morgan Hill one on Wednesday, um, but I didn't look at homes. Um, but I, but you understand, I believe you ought to go to the board tour, but I think that that does not change the fact that you ought to plan times to go preview homes in the area you wish to become the expert in, right? That doesn't mean you can't sell homes other places, but does everybody understand the thing about specialization? Hmm. Right, so I need to have um, an operation on my foot, so I say to the doctor, when can we schedule that? And the doctor's looking at his calendar and he says, Mondays, Mondays I deliver babies, so no foot surgery. Tuesdays, uh, heart surgery, I do heart surgery on Tuesdays, brain surgery on Wednesdays, uh, dermatology is Thursdays. Um, I, 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 could, I could get you in Friday, do you understand, do you want a doctor that does heart surgery, brain surgery, delivers babies, uh, works on rashes, anything you got? I don't know, what, what hurts? Show me. Uh, does that sound like a professional to you? How about lawyers, do they do that? Does the lawyer say, I don't care, criminal, civil, constitutional law, want, want to go to the Supreme Court, I don't care, small claims, I'll take anything, right? Do you understand real estate agents start to put out that kind of energy? Isn't that right? So that doesn't mean you couldn't list a home in Hollister if it fell in your lap, but you might want to pick a geographic area and learn it so you know something about something, and then you can expand from that. Analyze the MLS. Have I mentioned this before? Every, 
do you have, if you showed me your calendar, a block time every day that you're studying the MLS, studying the market, working on your elevator speech, what am I going to say today, what's happening today, what do the statistics show, what could I share of value to somebody thinking about buying or selling a house? Do you choose time blocking? Ah, Tom, um, Tom, what you need to do is to block time to do time blocking. <laughs> it's helpful. Choose numbers and statistics from the MLS and use the data in a sentence later that same day. I would put a star next to that one. Pick something from the MLS that you think is interesting. Use it in a sentence. Now, some agents that I know use it on in a sentence, and they leave that in their voice message when somebody calls them. Right? They change their voice message almost every day. Hey, did you see today? It's Monday, you know, November, whatever. Uh, you know, and they have their name, and they say, I don't know if you noticed, the market is picking up, the market's slowing down. You know, they say something in addition to the voicemail. They say something. And then they get in the habit of working it in conversations during the day. So if you're at Starbucks, can you say just about anything you want without them listening to you? Just about. So you could practice saying your what's happening to the real estate market to the person at Starbucks, right? You get in the habit of it. Choose a partner from your team or market center with whom you can practice the numbers and meet weekly. Have I mentioned the idea of having an accountability partner? I was, you weren't here yesterday, but somebody, you weren't here. You two have to be accountability partners because neither of you were here. So um, <laughs> if you don't show up, we assign you somebody. So would it be valuable? Doesn't misery love company? Yeah. So would it be easier for you to do this if you actually had a partner and you practice the scripts and you had a morning discussion about what's going on in the market, uh, would that make you more articulate, right, both of you, right? Or do you want to practice? So how's the real estate market today? Do you want to practice what you're going to say the first time a prospective client asks you? Is that the time you want to practice? Wing it, make up stuff on the spot. Or would you rather every morning know what you're going to say that day when somebody asks you? Uh, <laughs> analyze the MLS. Use your local MLS to track numbers in their price range. So uh, one of the things that I was talking about yesterday when I was going through how to analyze the MLS statistics is, is that what's happening varies by zip code, city, and price range. Certain price ranges move much quicker than other price ranges. So it's not just saying, what are the average days on market? The question is, what are the average days on market for a property priced around 850? I just said that's a different answer from what are the average days on market, right? Are there more expired listings in certain price ranges? The answer is yes. Are there more inventory in certain price ranges? The answer is yes. Are there more pendings in certain price ranges? The answer is yes. Would it be good for you to know that when you're having a pricing discussion with somebody. Now, I actually started making a video of me doing this, but it was driving me crazy too. But I've made a, it's called the total market overview. And what the total market overview does is it analyzes the market on certain criteria based on price range, right? Certain price ranges do better than others. By the way, if your seller was a little bit outside of, the, of a hefty price range, do you understand you knowing that homes under this mark are selling better than homes over this mark? Would that be the kind of information that might actually convince somebody to lower the price? Do you understand sellers think you want them to lower the price because you're lazy and you don't want to work? That's right. You're not even going to try. All right. You want to ease. By the way, sometimes I've gone on listing appointments and they would say, well, we talked to, you know, we talked to Vera and she says that our home ought to be priced at 900000 And I'll say, well, I, I, I can imagine she said that because she wants an easy sale. That's why she said 900000 because she doesn't have to work. She doesn't try. You see, I, I believe your home is worth more than that. I heard you when you gave me the tour. I see 
why your home is special. And I'm going to work to get you the highest price possible, 975. Now, if you were them, who would you rather list your home with, Vera at 900 or me for 975? 975. All right, now I have a listing. <laughs> and then in two weeks, you know, we ought to talk about pricing, right? We're a little... So, yes, uh, Tom asked the question, um, am, am I talking about making these statistics in different price ranges? The answer is yes. Let's say you are curious and you uh, do not believe that I thought of every I, everything on my own, and you type in total market overview, V-I-E-W-I-E-W, -E -W -E -W, real estate, total market overview, real estate. Oh, really? Total uh, PDX property grid looks like an ad, total market overview report. That one actually doesn't look very good. This video by a guy named Bruce Hardy um, shows uh, him explaining the total market overview. And here's another one about it. And if you uh, look through them, you're going to find somebody that will give you an Excel market leader uh, has an Excel spreadsheet that they will share for a total market overview. And so what it does is it looks at certain criteria based upon price. I'll just do this because I, I don't know why. Total. So I actually, oh, here, total. There it was. Total market overview. Total market overview. Sample report. I actually have a folder called total market overview. Of course, I'm sure most of you do too. Oh, no, you don't. Anyhow, so this is a. I'm going to. So this is how to do it. I'm going to get rid of that. All right. No, maybe not now. Um, and so what? And and this was. We got to work on those numbers. But basically, this shows you a list of things that you might want to analyze. And the hardest part of doing this is figuring out what price range is. Because there's some points where $100,000 is a good price range, and then some places where it's 200000 and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, you understand? At some point, we're jumping up by a million. All right, so I don't know why I went on to that, but I was talking about all analyzing the MLS. By the way, you think doing that total market overview is a painful process. That's why I have an assistant that I may do it. Do you think other agents are doing it? Mm -mm. No. So if you were the seller and there were two agents talking to you about selling your home and one of them seemed to have done far more an analysis of what's going on, knew more, had better information, better data, which one are you going to list with? A high better data. And will you be a stronger agent just for going through that process? Uh, all right. What else we do? Uh, take the shifting market into consideration when evaluating the comparables. If the market is rising, we take the last sales and add. If the market is dropping, we take the last sales and subtract. Our price is going up or down, right? Right now, they're still going up, but not a lot. Get the big picture. Prioritize the deal rather than the area. Buyers will prioritize the deal rather than the area. Your sellers are competing with homes in their price range all over town. Those of you that have watched me do a market analysis, one of the things I do is add in. So when I do a market analysis, I start by showing what are active, what are pending and what are closed sales in the area. But then I show them all the active listings in a much larger area that would be competing with theirs. Do you understand? A, Comparative market analysis for a neighborhood is like looking at a house through a knot hole in a fence, right? You're looking, all you can see is this little house. And when we do a CMA, we look at other homes in the neighborhood. What if there are no active listings in that immediate neighborhood? If you were a seller and I brought you a market analysis and it showed no other active listings in your area, what would you be thinking? You'd be hearing cash register sounds, right? I've got the only one. By showing them, so in my neighborhood that I was farming, I knew, not only did I know that they were looking at other areas, I knew that those builders built in other areas. And some people were looking in other zip codes on the other side of town at similar homes. Is it true that Blossom Valley would compete with Cambrian 
and Willow Glen and Santa Teresa and Evergreen and Morgan Hill, right? You understand if you just did a radius around there and said, where could people come from? You have a much bigger area. And so sellers need to know that they're not just competing with the homes in the neighborhood, they're competing with a whole bunch of homes on the market. And when you show them that there's like 400 homes that they're competing with, they get a better attitude, right? Rather than only one. Uh, use formulas and graphs. Now, we disk profiles, right? The driver, the influencer, the supportive, stable, and the C is uh, an analytical style. Now, the question is, if you got, if you were going on to an appointment, first of all, would it be a useful thing to learn more about personality styles? how to identify behavioral styles and how to interact with them. That'd be a useful thing. So of the four styles, one part of this, I don't know if this is, is this interesting to anybody, right? So the behavioral matrix is a grid and the top part of the grid is active and the bottom part is passive. And then to the left and right, the left side is um, formal and the right side is informal. All right. Now, a formal passive, the company I used to work for called an analyzer, and we call them a C, and a D we called controllers, and they don't like data. So I'm on a listing appointment, I'm talking to the seller, he gets up, <coughs> Uh, listing presentation and he walks into the kitchen while I'm talking to him and starts fussing around in the kitchen. At some point I paused and he said, are you going to need a key tonight? No. Um, and I, let me see. I can hear some, somebody is, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to worry about it. So do you understand that's a driver, right? He didn't want to hear. He didn't want to see my stuff. He didn't want to read anything. He was there to list his house. I showed up. He wanted, he wanted to know how much. I told him a number. He said, okay. How much commission? I told him. He said, fine. Where do I sign? I'm not kidding. Now, do I, I didn't know that that was him when I walked in, right? So you have to be prepared for the analyzer. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? You can't fake the analyzer because they're all about data and you're not going to be able to fake them. Um, does that make sense, everybody, what I'm saying? I'm just trying to, here we go. I'm going to. Mute other people. There we go. Can you guys hear me online? I hope so. I may have muted myself, but I have a feeling. No. All right. So if you bring graphs and statistics, you don't have to show them if the people aren't of that behavioral style. But if you don't bring them and you're dealing with engineers, you're in trouble. When they start to ask you detailed questions. Now, I've actually heard real estate agents say, Nobody cares about graphs and charts. It's not important. It doesn't mean anything. And my response to that is, you don't care about graphs and charts. And to you, they're not meaningful. But that does not mean, we're, that does not mean that our clients don't care about graphs and charts. Right? You understand? They're, an, they're more analytical. Um, and they're going to appreciate it. This is called the activity index. I use it, it was, it's had other names, but actives plus pendings divided by pendings equals the activity index. And I actually believe um, that Keller Williams has the formula wrong, but I'm not, we're going to see. Um, I, I shouldn't have said it that way, but the absorption rate, I'm going to give you an example. We'll, we'll do an example and I'll explain what this means about something. The absorption rate is how many active homes are on the market divided by the number of homes sold in the last 30 days 
tells you over what time period they are absorbed. Let me go back to this one. The activity index is essentially what percentage of the current inventory is under contract. So let's say there's 100 homes for sale in a neighborhood. How many of them are pending? Let's say 50. So our index is 50. 50% 50 of all active listings are pending. They've sold, right? That percentage, by the way, is a day-by-day -day pulse of how the real estate business is doing. You'll see that range move up and down. And when the market starts to pick up, all of a sudden the percentage of pendings will shoot up. And when the market slows down, you'll see a drop in the percentage of pendings because the pending ones are closing and being removed and the percentage being added isn't as good. Right? Does everybody understand that knowing what percent is pending in any given market. And I'll show you an example my assistant and I have done. Would that, do you think that varies between Mountain View and Milpitas and Morgan Hill? Varies a lot. So we do, and I'll show you. show you. And so the absorption rate is what, if, if we stopped adding new homes on the market, how long will it take us to sell the ones we have? So we're not going to list any more homes how long would it take us to sell the ones we have? That's called the absorption rate. These are all terms that you're going to hear a lot more of as the market corrects a little bit. Um, let's see. Um, formulas and graphs, visual information, Excel. I was doing that the other day. Wasn't I doing that the other day? Approaching sellers. You can only afford to work with the very pre-qualified sellers before the listing appointment. Uh, this assumes you're busy. What ruins many real estate agents' careers is the one or the two or the three. What I mean by that is that if you only have one or two or three clients, if you only have one listing, if you only have one buyer, if you only have one escrow, chances are you're going to devote way too much time to that client than you probably ought to. And you're going to do it because you don't have anything else to do. I only got one listing. What else do I do? I only got one buyer. Might as well work with them. So as the market, if you were busier, you're going to find it that you're not going to want to go visit somebody at their house, spend two hours just to find out they don't really want to sell it. And they were just curious and thought it would be fun to chat with the real estate agent. Right? Do you understand? When you have nothing to do, this sound, may sound like better than sitting in the office and watching the, you know, sitting on the couch watching the TV. Plus, you can tell the other people in the office you have an appointment. And then they're all, ooh, ooh, right, isn't that right? They go, ooh, right, and you're going to talk to somebody who really doesn't want to sell their home, but they just wanted to talk about it, right? As you, do you understand, there's a certain point where you're going to say, no, before we make an appointment, let me ask you a few questions, right? Let me ask you a few questions. And if they don't answer them, you could say, well, it doesn't seem like you're ready now. All right. Okay. So I can see you're excited. Update your listing presentation. First of all, that assumes you have one. All right. For some of you, write down, create listing <laughs> presentation. Tell the truth. I thought we were in sales. You are not doing yourself as any favors if you're tempted to soften the blow in order to get the listing. Now, what I was doing, I, I would do this depending on where the market was trending. So if the market was trending up, I would negotiate the listing. I would get the listing at any price, at just about any commission, so I had the listing and I could market the listing. If the listing is going down, you don't want that. All right, I learned the hard way, the farm area in Blossom Valley, at one point I had so many active listings that were not selling, that I listed a house and I didn't put my name writer on it. I didn't put a sign that had my name on it because it was embarrassing at how many listings I had in the neighborhood already. It was embarrassing. And then the owner called and complained and said, aren't you going to put your name on our listing? And I'm just like, do you understand when people drive through the neighborhood and they see your name over and over again on the same house they saw three months ago, all right, what, what's the impression they get? Don't list your home with him. Isn't that right? 
Do uh, you understand? Having a listing can be a great advertising. Having a listing that doesn't sell can ha not be a great advertising. All right. Basically, you've told your neighborhood you failed. All right. Does everybody understand? If the market is rising, you can be a little more flexible because the market can catch up. But if it's not rising, it's not catching up, and over and it's going to get worse and worse over time. And if they priced it right at the beginning, they would get more money than if they waited three months to price it right, because prices have dropped since then. Care enough about them to be strong up front and get the right price. You have to understand we're not doing it just because we want it to be easy and we don't want to have to work very hard. The reality is if they overprice, they are going to get less money in the end than they would have gotten if they had priced it right to begin with. If you don't believe that, you need, you're going to have difficulty selling real estate. But I know for a fact, I've seen people do this, they, this, is the, this is the script. You need to know that all of your potential clients have gone to seminars and they've learned the scripts. You may not be practicing your scripts. They're good at theirs. And the reason I say they attend seminars is because they always say pretty much the same thing. And you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, why don't we start high and then we could always come down later if it doesn't sell. Right? Do you understand? They, they, they must be seminars because everybody says that. And I always, this is what I say, by the way, I always carry this list with me, but I say, you know, I understand how you feel. You know, I, I really do. Uh, most people that are selling their home feel exactly the same way you do. You want to get the most money you possibly can from the sale of your house. It's a big investment. I, I get that. However, what I found is that the start high, come down later system has issues. And, and in fact, there's a lot of people that think that way. I brought a list of them with me to the appointment. I brought a list of all the people that thought we could start high and come down later. We call this list expired listings. Right? Do you understand? I have a list of all the people who did exactly what you're planning to do. You can see it has the history. Started here, and then they came down, and it never sold. Right? So, is that so? Do you understand? They're out of the market when everyone's looking at it. The herd is gone. They now are in the market and their price, and the buyers aren't there anymore. They've gone. The herd has moved on to other pastures. And now your house has been on the market for 30 days. And what do people say? What would you think? How, we'll make it easier. A house has been on the market for 60 days. What would you think about it? Something's wrong. What's wrong with it? Does, any, does anybody like leftovers? Do you, do you want do you want to be the one who gets the the piece of bread that no one else took? Is that what you want? The, the last the little heel of the bread that no one wanted? Is that what you wanted? Nobody wants that. Right? Do you understand that's what the house starts to look like? Right? <laughs> all of those people that saw it, they can't all be wrong. All those people that looked at it and didn't buy it, they're not all wrong. Something's wrong with this house. Right. Or then you have the investors that will call you and say, I want you to show me homes on the market for more than 90 days. You know why? Because they're going to lowball them. They're going to come in with low offers because they're thinking it's been three months. They're getting desperate. They're getting needy. They're on the ropes. They're weaving and bobbing around. Now it's a chance for me to take advantage. Do you understand this is real, what I'm saying? Should you have that conversation with somebody or let them find out for themselves? Do you want you and them to self-discover that pricing high and coming down three weeks later doesn't work? Right? Do, do, you could either do this yourself or you could accept that that's not a good strategy. And by the way, look at expired listings. Look at the histories. Sometimes you can pull out one and put it down in front of them and say, that house was just around the corner. Notice it looks a lot like yours. See the similarities in these properties. You see that? 
look at what they see where they started. Notice they came down and then they came down and then they came down and then it expired. All right? Is that what is that what you want? Right. Price reduction. Um, clip out articles from the newspaper. Of course, what we really mean is Evernote Web Clipper. Right. Oh well. Um, so I don't. I don't even know what that is anymore. But um, uh, I use a program called Shareaholic. Shareaholic, and another one called Scribe Fire. And what those two programs do, it allows you to take pieces of web pages and convert them into something that you could use, like links or other, a bunch of different stuff, emails, documents, things like that. So is it possible that you're going to have clients that are interested in buying multifamily? They'll ask you this question. Is it a good time to buy a multifamily dwelling? This is a good time to buy fourplexes and things like that. Is it a good time? Do you know? So do you know what I did? I went to Google. I typed in, is now a good time to buy four places? Articles started to appear, which I would then clip and put into an email, and I sent it to the client for them to read. Right? Does that sound good? And by the way, it was useful to me to read the articles. It said it's a good time to buy multifamily. Um, <laughs> what are we doing? Return to the motivation if you sense they're not receptive. It all comes down to motivation. How bad do you want to sell your home in the time frame you have in mind? On a scale of zero to 10. How, with 10 being we'd do anything, I mean, anything, and zero meaning we really don't care if we sell it at all. Where would you rate yourselves in terms of motivation? By the way, I say this to people. I say this to people, just to get a gauge of where you are, what you love, what, what would you say? Are you a 10, a 5, 4, what? and they give a number, 6, 7. So what's keeping it from being a 10? Right. And then um, they usually at this point are saying, well, if we don't get the money we want, we don't want to sell it. Right? That's why they're not, no matter what, they want to get what they want. Some sellers may not be able to face reality and won't be able to list their home at the price needed to sell it. Sometimes I've told people, you aren't going to get that much money. No, it's not going to happen. And I've had people say, well, then we don't want to sell the house. Okay. Would they be appreciative that I told them the truth rather than listed their house knowing it would never sell at that price so I could do open houses? You, you, you think agents don't do this? Oh, yes, agents will buy listings. That's what we call buying. Buying a listing is when you come in, you look at the house, and you say, so what did the other agent say? Vera says it's worth 900000 And I'm like, 900000 That's hard to believe. You know, our, our office has sold several homes in this area for a lot more than that, and they weren't nearly as nice as yours. I don't know why she's saying 900000 Maybe she just wants an easy sale, right? Maybe that's what, she doesn't want to have to work. Maybe, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you, right? Do you understand? What do you think people want to believe that their house is worth more or less? More. And I'm telling them what they want to hear. I tell them that their kids are good looking and smart and the painting that the, they have that they did themselves is a masterpiece. <laughs> um, update and learn new scripts and dialogues. You'll need to speak with confidence to educate your sellers and vividly illustrate the realities of the new market. Agents that are going to be making money are studying how the market is shifting or able to explain how the market is shifting and to discuss it. Take time to learn new scripts. Choose a partner. They're doing that again. They seem all hung up on practicing scripts. I don't know why. Practice scripts. There it is again. Focus on your seller's need to ex focus more on your seller's need to express themselves. What that means is listen more than you talk. Ask more questions. Allow them. Sometimes people just need to tell you. So one of my people that I'm coaching called me up, and we've been talking about pricing. 
and the buyer wanted to make an offer that wasn't going to be accepted by a lot. And so she had that conversation with the buyer, and the buyer said, we sent her a nasty email, you're fired. You're not representing me. You're not trying to represent me. You're not trying to give me the right price. You're fired. I don't, I'm not going to work with you anymore. So she asked me, well, what should she do? And I said, just wait. And then the listing agent had contacted her, the offer that they had fell through. And I said, write up something and pretend you never got that other email. Just ignore it. We're in contract right now. And she just ignored it, wrote up again. The guy signed the offer, and they presented it. So do you understand? There will be people that will tell you, I will not list my home at any less than a million dollars. And guess what they'll do? They're going to list the home at less than a million dollars. But they have to tell you they're not going to do it. But then they're going to do it. But they want to tell you. And what you do is you listen to them explain why they are not going to do it. And you have empathy and do not. But keep them talking and listen to what they tell you. What's plan B if you can't sell your house for one million dollars? I understand you want a million dollars. If you don't get a million dollars, you're not going to sell your house. So what's plan B? Do you understand? We're back to why do they need to sell their house now? Because if they could say, no, I'm not going to sell it if I don't get that, then they don't need to sell their house now. Isn't that right? What's plan B? So what are you going to do if you can't sell your house? Stay here forever? One of the things that we were talking I forget who I was talking about, but there are a whole bunch of people right now that are house poor. They've retired. They're in homes with sometimes a million dollars of equity, but they don't have any income. And they're living on savings. And they've got this huge amount of money, but they can't access it. There are actually ways they can, right? And one of the things you could become more effective at is learning about things like deferred sales trusts and other type of investment opportunities, which would require a financial planner or somebody that knows those things but there are, but that, that's an issue. How do I get my money out of the house? They don't want to pay a capital gains tax, right? That's the idea. If they sell it, they don't have the money to pay a capital gains tax, right? They don't want to pay a capital gains tax, right? So um, that's when you listen to them, you need to find out why do they need that number, right? You know, and what if you don't get it? What do you? What's plan B? What are we going to do? Address objections before they come out. Send out a thorough CMA. Um, that stands for Country Music Awards in your pre-listing package or comparative market analysis. During this, bring up objections yourself and then sweep them away. Um, I did this because I was lazy, I mean, um, time efficient because I realized people were always asking me the same questions. And it took time because they would fumble around and figuring out how to ask the question. So finally, I got to a point where I'd say, you may be wondering, what about this? You may be thinking, how about that? You may be questioning, what do I do if? Right? You understand? And then I would just go through them. It takes a whole lot less time. And after you realize, they're going to ask you. Get the right price. If a buyer believes the house is poorly priced, they will write it off from the start. True? People make decisions about whether they're going to buy something emotionally at first. Once you've rejected something, is it likely you're going to go back and buy it? Less so. I know it's happened, right? But less so. Isn't, isn't that? Uh, even, so what that is actually saying is we have a very short window of time in order to make an impression on the buyer that they want to buy the house. Isn't that right? A really short time period. Uh, even if the price is subsequently reduced several times or home improvements are made, you've lost it forever, the best chance. People, I work with agents, and they're fixing. The, the house hasn't sold, so they're fixing stuff. They don't want to lower the price. So they're fixing stuff. Then 100 days has gone by, still isn't sold. Now they're lowering the price. So they fix stuff, and they lower the price, and they fix stuff, and they lower the price. And did you understand when a house is over 100 days on the market? Mm, it gets harder. At 200 days, we have a stubborn person on our hands, right? Uh, for homes that have a price reduction, the time to sell increases by two to three times. Could you prove that by looking through the MLS? 
Homes with price reductions have a longer day on market than homes that do not have price reductions. Because the homes without price reductions sell in two weeks over list price to all cash buyers sometimes, right? The ones that have been on the market for 45 days and have reduced their price three times uh, sell for way under and oftentimes less qualified financing. Let's go looking uh, some looking at the comparables here in the MLS your neighborhood. How would you be? How much would you be willing to pay for your house if you're a buyer today? They always say two million. Give what I've shown you about the market. What do you think your house will sell for? What do you think? What look? What do you think we need to do? Here are the numbers. So these are there are many scripts. What I used the way I used to phrase it was this. So I've got the market analysis. And so I've got pictures of houses, right? And I've got graphs and charts and statistics. And so the way I would refer to this as this is the facts of record. The facts of record for 95136 is that homes are on the market for this much time, that this is what the average price is, and these are what homes that look like yours have sold for recently. Now you need to understand that the appraiser is going to be looking at the same facts of record that I've got right here in determining whether or not what appraisal to give to your house. And you understand the problem is, is that even if I can con, I, I mean convince a buyer to pay your price, I still have to get the appraiser to appraise it at that number, and the appraiser is looking at these facts of record, right? Do you understand the way I'm phrasing that? This isn't an opinion of mine. These are the facts, and these are the facts the appraiser is going to look at. And I share this with sellers. Do you know what I tell buyers? Let's offer high. I tell buyers this, you cannot overpay for a house if you have an appraisal contingency. Let's offer the moon. We're talking about in a market that's shifting. So the answer is yes. If you call me up, Bobby, and say, I want you to help me write an offer. I want to know what we should offer. What's my first question? Anybody know? How many offers are there on this house? Have you talked to the, if you say I haven't talked to a listing agent, I'd say call the listing agent and find out how many disclosure packages are out, how many calls he's gotten, how many offers he has in hand, how many offers he thinks he's going to be getting, what's going, find that out, and then ask me what the price ought to be. All right, now if you come back and say he's got two offers already and he's expecting four more, we're going to write an offer without contingencies for the maximum price the buyers can pay. But let's say the listing agent says no offers. I got nothing. Please, Mavika, write an offer. We, we really need to sell this. All right, now we write an offer with contingencies because we're not competing with anybody else. And the contingency is going to be an appraisal contingency. And so I will tell the buyers, let's go in high so we get the house because we're not done talking about price. And when the appraisal comes in low, you don't have to buy it. And now we go to the seller and say, obviously, your home is overpriced. According to a professional expert, neutral third party, your home is overpriced. And is it easier to get the seller to lower their price and when they're in the middle of escrow and are already packing than it is to get them to lower their price when you're making an offer in the first place? So we offer more. My offers are always high, real high. Right, because we're going to get an appraisal, and the appraisal is going to come in low, and then we'll pound down the price. Right? Does everybody understand the reality of this? So even if I convince them to price it high, that doesn't mean I can get them that price unless the buyer doesn't have appraisal as a contingency. Um, does that make sense, the facts of record? Right. And by the way, the other thing that I would do is I would show people, like, here are... Remember I was talking about the three, two or three comparables? Here are the homes that yours is competing with the most. 
and I usually pay with their, which one would you say is most comparable, most like yours? And when they pick one, you understand these all have prices on them too, right? And at, at that point, we're getting them to self-identify that they're probably in that price range. What happens if we overprice? There's two markets. There's the in the market and then the out of the market, the tail of two markets. A seller's market, notice how big in the market is. We had, I helped an agent write an offer in San Mateo. It was $749,000 was the list price. We offered $900,000 and didn't get it. No contingencies, none, no contingencies. No loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, no inspection contingency. We offered $900,000 and didn't get it. Do you understand how wide that market was at that time, right? Nine hundred thousand dollars on a seven fifty is still in, apparently in the market because what's out of the market in the seller's market is a very narrow band. When the market shifts, what's in the market now has shrunk, and what's out of the market is now enormous. And you have a shift where the majority of the properties are not selling quickly at all; they're sitting there. And so we have, uh, we have to be more precise in this market than the other one, right? The other one, you could be $100,000 off and it would still, will still work sometimes. Here, you can't be. We have these charts, by the way, in our presentation materials. Um, no man's land. Out of the market, no man's land. The tail, no, this is condition versus comps. Do I really want to talk about no? It, again, is the um, we want to price it? What does it say? Uh, think uh, fill in the they have actually a chart for this where they're actually asking agents to fill it out. Current listings in your market that you consider in the market, out of the market, and no man's land. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that. What do you think price adjustments have to? So basically the assignment that went along with this is they wanted you to look through the MLS and find listings and analyze if they're overpriced and if so how much you would price them by. Does this seem like a waste of time? I'll tell you a really common question you're going to be asked as an experienced agent is what do you think my house is worth? What do you think my house is worth? My house is listed at 825. Do you think that's high? All right. So have you gone through the process of analyzing prices? Do you, under, do you understand where I'm going with this? I'm suggesting that you become very good at analyzing homes that have sold are for sale and are pending such that you can give people meaningful advice. And spending some time studying the market and looking at listings, being curious. This house has been on the market all this time. What's wrong with it? What should it be priced at? Let's say that owner, you met him at the grocery store and the owner said, yeah, my home isn't selling. What do you think I had to price it at? So practice. Practice. I did the seller's market, uh, buyer's market. Does there, you, you realize what a seller's market is and a buyer's market is? What does it mean that we're in a seller's market? And what it really means is that people are not selling, as a general rule. Seller's markets mean people aren't selling. They don't sell. Homes don't sell in the seller's market very often. There aren't very many sales in a seller's market. Because a seller's market means there are few homes for sale and many people that want to buy them. So most people are not selling in a seller's market, which is why it's a seller's market. If the market shifts and we have a buyer's market, what does it mean that we have a buyer's market? And what it means is people aren't buying. Most people don't buy in the buyer's market. That's why it's called the buyer's market, because there's all these homes for sale, but not many, very many people buying it. So when do people buy? They buy in the seller's market. 
And when do people sell? They sell in a buyer's market. Does that sound like a good idea to you? If you were buying stocks, I thought you bought low and sold high, not buy high and sell low. Isn't that, I thought that was the idea. Does everybody understand that's really what we're saying? And people that are, right now you're at a unique opportunity because people are all talking about timing and at the cusp and the nexus and all that sort of stuff, right? Because has it shifted yet? Teensy bit, but not a lot. Are prices still going up? Yes, not as much as they were, but still going up. Can you imagine the seller saying, I want to wait for it to peak before I put my home on the market? I want to get the most ever. The problem with that is, is that we don't know that the market has peaked until the peak has passed. How do you know that prices are not going up anymore? Because they're going down. So what happens to the herd? So all of these sellers that aren't selling, they're like the herd of wildebeests standing on the plain, you know, pawing the ground and snorting. And then all of a sudden prices start going down. It's like a gun goes off. The herd perks up. The herd becomes alert and the herd starts to move. And all of a sudden, everyone's putting their home on the market. Right, do you understand? All the people that are waiting for the market to peak see the prices are dropping. So we're going to put our home on the market because the market is peaking. And we want to get the most money possible. What would you do if you were a buyer if all of a sudden you saw that a whole bunch of more homes were going on the market, there's a whole bunch more listings and prices are going down? What would you do if you were a buyer? Wait. So what happens is on a dime, the market shifts. And there's an explosion of new listings with price droppings and the buyers pull back, waiting for the market to hit bottom, right? Because that's what, the, what they're going to be telling you is, well, we want to wait for the market to hit bottom before we buy a house. The problem is you don't know that the market has hit bottom until it left the bottom. And that means prices are going up. And then what happens when everybody sees prices going up? They, it shifts again, right? You understand? And now all the buyers start to buy. And you understand, that's what happened the last time. We were in a buyer's market, and all of a sudden it started to shift. And the herd of, I believe that over a certain period of time, the same number of people buy and sell real estate. Over a, a long enough period of time, the same numbers buy and sell real estate. So if you have a period where not a lot of people are buying real estate, what does that mean is going to happen? You're going to have a period where a lot more people are buying real estate. So that when buyers aren't buying and they sit and sit and sit and sit and sit and then all of a sudden they decide to buy and the herd moves, the inventory is not there because no one was buying. So there's low inventory and all of a sudden there's a herd of wildebeest running, right? And so prices go up and everything goes crazy and, oh, and then buyers are going, oh my God, this is crazy. We all got to go buy now. And then it gets crazier and crazier and you're getting 60 offers, right? Do you understand timing the market is dangerous? Time in is safe. Right. For what? Well, the recording, the recording may be done later, but the MLS reports it the next day. The recording. Oh, I see what you're saying. The close of escrow. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So 45 days ago was actually the highest price. Right. Actually, what we do, what we look at in shifting markets are pendings. Pendings become much more important in shifting markets. Right. Well, but okay. The house is listed for 950 and it sold in 13 days. What's the chance they lowered their price? Slim. Right? Because you wouldn't give up in two weeks. Yeah. You'd stick to your price longer than that. So it depends on when it's sold. And if I were the listing agent, I'd tell you if you'd call me. I'd just say, you know, whatever. I, You know, especially if it was above the list price. Uh, how can you use MLS statistics to explain the effects of supply and demand on your market? 
Um, don't chase the market, whether it's going up and down, you want to price your listings ahead of the market, ahead of it on the way up and ahead of it on the way down. A useful thought. How many more of these do I have? Not too many, I think. Um, manage your listings on this. I can't even see what time it is on this screen. One. 12.50. What time is it? 12, 1.15? Okay. Uh, we're almost done with this. Um, custom, we're going to be spending more money about customer service, and we're going to actually talk about what to do when listings are overpriced. And what you would do is, if somebody says, well, if we don't get what we want in two weeks, we could always come down, I would schedule a price reduction then. If they won't take the price I want, I'll say, okay, we'll try your price for the first few weeks, but if it doesn't sell, then we'll try my price. Does that seem fair? All right, and I write it in the listing agreement that if the property has not sold by this date, we are, the new price will be that. Right. Is this a more um, difficult conversation to have with somebody? Telling them that you're going to require they lower their price at a certain time? Yeah. Um, auction your listings. I'm talking about that. Seller concessions. We're not going. I'm not going to cover the rest of this stuff because we're um, really just looking at um, putting together an action plan. I think the point is pretty straightforward. Know the market, learn about pricing, it's going to become more important. And it's hard to know the market and learn about pricing without looking at homes. That's it. That's what I've got. Next uh, Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to be up visiting my friends in Santa Rosa. And... Uh, Anything else important going on?